Good morning. Welcome to Deaf Bible Study. One day before Sunday. Why am I saying that? Because we understand on Sunday, every Sunday of the year, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And tomorrow we will do the same. It is Easter Sunday morning tomorrow. And it made me think about some things this last week. I've been thinking about it a lot. And I was thinking about good, good news, good news for dark days. Today we're living in a time we could call dark days. But I think it was worse just over 2,000 years ago. If this were the week that Jesus Christ had been crucified earlier this week, if this was the week, this day, Saturday, would have been, I think, the darkest day in the history of the world. I want to talk about that day. Um, have you ever had a day yourself when you felt like everything that could go wrong was wrong? Uh, have you ever looked out your window and you see the clouds and rain and the winds blowing and you, your heart gets... Or maybe your, your bills, they're due and your heart sinks. Or maybe you're thinking about, oh, next week I've got to go see the doctor and I'm not sure what's going to happen and you get worried and what am I going to do? Or the worst for me, you have an appointment to go to the dentist, the dentist. I hate going to the dentist, but whatever. I want to tell you there is good news today for the dark days of your life. Uh, we all face dark times. And today I want to share with you some light for the darkness. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've come today because we need you. And we pause right here to begin. We've opened our Bibles. We want to talk about Bible truths, but we need the Holy Spirit of God to guide us, us into all the truth that's here. And I pray that you would help today, help us be focused on not the things that are around us, that's all distractions for us. Help us to put aside all of those things and to focus on you and the truth that we find here in the foundation of our faith, the Bible. Help us to see things so clearly today that we cannot miss and help us to apply to our heart the truths that are here and then live in this world with the good news that we have from the Bible in these dark days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, I want you to open to the Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, all the way toward the front of your Bible, Exodus chapter number 12. And I want to talk to you about some things before, before we arrive there in the Old Testament, I want you to think about, um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to imagine a little bit. Imagine yourself as one of the disciples, one of the followers of Jesus Christ. You know, he had 12 men and others too. There were some women who followed Jesus Christ, but we know of the 12 disciples, we've called them. I want you to think about them. And what a, an amazing week they had had if this were the week that Jesus would rise tomorrow, Sunday, tomorrow. If this were the week, I want you to think about what would have happened in your heart as a follower of Jesus Christ all this last week, all right? So we begin one week before, one week before the resurrection, what happened? Well, Jesus, with his followers, uh, Jesus got onto a donkey. 
And he rode from the top of the Mount, the Mount of Olives, which is just across from Jer Jerusalem city here. There's this little mountain, the Mount of Olives. Jesus started there on a donkey and he rode down these streets. By the way, they were not like highways today that we have. They were just small, uh, small, really places that you walk. They didn't have cars. They didn't have the things. So it was small and lined along the sides of the street were people. All the people saw Jesus coming on the donkey and they started praising God and saying, Hosanna in the highest. And they were excited. Uh, they were talking about Jesus Christ as if he were king. He was a hero. And he was riding and his followers, imagine being one of the 12 disciples. You're following and I mean, you're looking around. It's like a huge parade that's coming. And, and the people were cheering and they were lined and uh, they took uh, branch, branches from the trees, from the palm trees. They took them and they laid them, they waved them. It was an exciting time. This is one week before the resurrection. And they, they were excited. And then just later on, they had a meal together. And they enjoyed fellowship. It was, it was like a celebration meal. I'm sure the followers were talking away. Talk, blah, 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 blah. They were so excited. And Jesus just kind of watching. And after a little while, Jesus took some bread and he passed it out. He explained, this bread represents my body. It will be broken for you. And I'm sure the followers were quiet now and they were a little confused. They didn't understand fully. And then Jesus took the cup and he, he drank and he said, this cup represents my blood. And he passed it and they drank. Again, a little, little confused. Not sure what's happening, but they're still excited about the parade that just happened recently. And and they're excited about all that's happening with Jesus. And then Jesus talks about a person who will betray him, betray him. And during the meal, Judas Iscariot, he stands up and he leaves. Nobody knows why, but that all happened. But very, very, very quickly, the attitude of the people changed. And Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he, he took his disciples and he went into a garden, a garden, garden of Gethsemane. He takes his followers and he tells them, watch and pray. And it was during the night, it was late, it was late at night and the, the disciples were sleepy and, and they all, they fell asleep all. And Jesus prayed with his father. We know the story. But imagine yourself one of the followers. Jesus says to us, watch and pray. And we all fall asleep. We fail the Lord. We wake up to the noise of the soldiers who come to arrest Jesus Christ. It's there that we see Judas Iscariot kiss Jesus Christ. And the, the soldiers grabbed Jesus Christ and, and uh, you know, Peter took out his sword and cut off the ear and Jesus puts it back on. All of those things happened very quickly on that night. But truthfully, all of the followers of Jesus Christ, all. I wish if I was there and I was one of them, I would have stayed. But true, I would have run also and you would have run also. And so they all scatter. From a, from a distance, I'm sure, they were trying to watch what was happening in Jerusalem. It was during that time that Jesus was beaten. They spit on him. They cursed him. And eventually they, they crucified Jesus Christ. They nail the nails into his hands and his feet. And they bring up the cross. And there he is. And he's crucified. I'm sure that the disciples... Even though they were not close, we know that John was there, but none of the others were there that we know of. But I'm sure they were watching from a distance. 
This is on a hillside on the northern side of Jerusalem. It was in a common area. So many people were, could, walk, could walk by and walk by, and I'm sure that the followers were somewhere back, but they were watching. And for six hours, they saw the anguish of Jesus Christ there on the cross. And finally, they saw one last, and they saw Jesus die. They watched as the soldier thrust the spear into the side of Jesus Christ, and they saw the, the blood and the water flow out. They knew Jesus Christ is dead. What? What? Jesus Christ is dead? It's not possible. How is it possible? But they saw the men come, take his body down from the cross, wrap him up, and they watched again as people carried the body of Jesus to, to a tomb. They saw them take his body into this tomb. It was, it was near in a garden near where he was crucified. And they, they put his body in there. And they rolled a big stone and they closed off the front. And they left his body. What, hap what happened next, I believe, great sadness came on all the followers. They ran home and they locked the door on their houses because they were looking for the followers of Jesus Christ. If we were one of those disciples, we would know Jesus Christ was crucified. Who is next? Maybe it's me. And they hid, really? Today we are isolated here, really around the world today. And those disciples isolated themselves. They ran home and they stayed. Now remember, this was the first day, the, the day after Jesus was crucified, was the first day of the Passover feast. And so you can imagine on that first, the first day that they're there in their homes, Jesus is, is buried just before the sun goes down. So all night and the next day, they're, they're staying in their homes. They're not moving. And they're in there and they begin, to, they begin to think about all so many different things. We thought Jesus Christ was going to be the king. And we thought he was going to rule. And now they killed Jesus. And what are we going to do? And I'm sure that during that time, as they heard the celebration around their homes for the Passover, I'm sure that they thought about all the way back to the Old Testament, 1,300 years before, when Israel was captive in Egypt. And you remember that God was going to free the Jews, Israel, from that captivity. But what did he do? God, ten plagues that hit the nation of Egypt. But the last one was the worst. We, we, we call it the death of the firstborn. That happened 1,300 years before. And ever since that time, the Jews celebrated the feast of Passover. And what they would do is, before the sun went down... On the first, the first day of that feast, they would kill a lamb. And by the way, I want to tell you, when Jesus Christ was there on the cross, it was exactly the same time when they would have been killing the Passover lambs in Jerusalem at the same time. Jesus died at the same time. Uh, this day was a time for them to remember what had happened. So that's the first day. The second day comes, gets a little worse. I'm thinking that if I was a follower, the first day would have been bad. I would have thought that the day after Jesus is crucified is as bad as it could be, but the second day would be worse. It would be worse because I would understand that the, the celebration is happening all around and I'm staying inside my house I'm afraid because uh, the death of Jesus Christ means maybe me, I'm next. 
and fear begins to really stay on my heart. There's no celebration in my home. It's quiet. We're hiding. We're fearful. Any noise we hear near the door, we get nervous. Is that the soldiers coming for me? And it's a nervous day. The third day, which would be today, Saturday of that week, the third day, it's the darkest. Uh, the Passover celebration is continuing on, but I'm continuing to hide in my home. And it's darker and darker and darker. Grief has begun to really settle on my heart. I, I understand that um, I thought the Messiah was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I thought that was Jesus Christ the same. But his body is still there in that garden tomb there. I know where it is. I saw the place. And I know that huge stone was rolled and he's still, his body is still there. My Messiah is dead. This is a dark time. Think for a little bit with me. What do you think Mary, the mother of Jesus, was thinking? Of all the people, I think Mary had, had the, the best opportunity, maybe, to know what was happening. But she still is a mother. She watched her son be crucified. She heard the cries of, of Jesus from, from the cross. Her heart must still have been broken on this Saturday. I think about John. He was there. Jesus looked at him and said, Behold thy mother, and mother, behold thy son, John. Really, John was given responsibility to care for Jesus' mother from that point on. And John's probably thinking, what do I do next? What am I responsible for? What? And he had a whole list of things, plus the fear of persecution for him. I think about Peter. Peter denied the, the Lord three times. The last time Peter saw Jesus Christ was when he denied the third time and the rooster crowed and Jesus turned and looked at Peter and Peter saw the eyes of compassion Jesus had for him. For three days he could not sleep. He could not forget those eyes. That's Peter. I think about Mary... Magdalene, the woman who Jesus had cast out seven demons from, a woman who loved Jesus so much, but her heart had to be crushed. So now I want you to go to the book of Exodus for a little bit. I have to review with you and then I'll, then I'll be finished. But I want you to see in, in Exodus chapter 12, I want you to look at verse 5. We're going to begin in verse 5. We're going to read a few, a few of the verses. I'm going to skip down some. Just, so just follow me. I'll put them here. This is Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. It says, Your lamb. This was just before uh, Israel escaped from Egypt. This is just before that night of the Passover, the first time. And, and God explained to Moses and the children of Israel what they needed to do. He said in verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. It means without anything wrong, clean. It should be a male of the first year. And ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Verse 6, he says in verse 6, And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So God tells the people, take a lamb without anything wrong with it, separate it, and keep it until the 14th day of that month. At that time, at nighttime, as the sun goes down, I want you to kill that lamb. And, and he, goes, he goes on, verse 7, he says this, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. 
So God gives specific uh, instructions how this is to happen. First, this lamb is innocent. The lamb is without spot. The, the lamb itself done nothing wrong but it's to be pulled out from among the other sheep. This is a special lamb. This lamb is the best lamb that you had, less than one year old itself. That lamb was to be separated, and it was to be killed at sundown of that 14th day, the specific time. It was to be killed. That lamb, the, the blood of that lamb was then to be used and placed on the doorposts, of the house where they live. That lamb must die to protect the people inside that house. Drop down to verse 12 now. In chapter 12, verse 12, it says this, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both of man and beast, and against all gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So God says, I'm going to warn you, after this happens, kill the lamb. That night, that same night, God said, I'm going to pass through Egypt, and I'm going to kill the firstborn of every man and animal on that night. I'm going to do this. Why? Because I want the idol worshipers of Egypt to know I am the Lord. You can see it there at the end. He goes on verse 13. He says this, and the blood, the blood from the lamb shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, God said, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. We've heard this story before. So God's plan, every house that does not have the blood on the side posts and the door, when I come through Egypt, I will kill the firstborn of every man and animal in the home without the blood. So we see that day, that the lamb was killed. When the people were killing their best lamb, they were not celebrating. They were not having a, a party. They were not enjoying themselves. It was a sad day. They had to kill their best lamb. For why? But it was, it was a dark day, but it was a day of really deliverance. Deliverance was coming in the future. It would come, but it was not that on the day that they killed the lamb. Drop down all the way to verse 23. Verse 23, I want you to see. It says, For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into in unto your houses to smite you. I want you to notice where God told the Israelites to put the blood. In this verse, it says here, upon the lintel. That is the top part of a door. It is, it's the, uh, by the way, if there is an earthquake, what do you do? You run into a door Frame why? Because it's strong, because it has that piece, it has those strong, it's the strongest place in your house. And God said, so put it up there on the lintel is on that top piece, and then on both of the two sides. So when the person took the blood of the lamb and he put it on his door, I know it was 1,300 years before Jesus Christ would be crucified. But if you look at this picture, you will see that where the blood was placed on the door makes a shape of what? Of the cross. I'm sure when they were putting the blood up here, 
that it was drip it was dripping down onto the bottom as well and it showed a picture of the cross we know that this old testament story here in exodus is a picture of jesus christ in the future 1300 years in the future now i want you to see this god gave us this picture he gave us this this picture picture because he wants us to see that there is good news for dark days there is good news for dark days your life you see some things that are happening right now and you think oh it's really so sad i don't know what's going to happen and and uh, i will tell you that without the blood sacrifice of that lamb in egypt those people would die the firstborn would die it happened all all over egypt's land it happened god proved his power but he protected his people with the blood of the lamb that's good that's good news it's good news for you and i because god has provided for us a lamb too I want you to notice it's hard for us to understand this but before good things can happen sometimes bad things must happen too for example when you want to you want to grow a plant you put a a seed into the ground right now it's the time of year when flowers are they're blooming it's beautiful time right now trees are we're seeing the buds on the trees again but if you wanted to grow a flower, you would take a seed and you would drop it into the ground. Or you wanted to grow some fruit, whatever. You would drop a seed in the ground. Eventually, this little shoot is going to come up. But what happened to the seed underneath in the ground? What happened to the seed? It must die. That seed will never be alive again afterwards. It produced this and it dies itself. This plant will produce more seeds that can be used later, but the, the original seed under the ground here is dead. It's the same picture that the Bible gives us of what Jesus Christ did for us. I want you to see just, just two verses. We see that, that empty tomb. That is the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ came here, lived without sin, perfect, died, was buried, and the good news, he rose again. That tomb is empty. There's no body there. But I want you to see two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Two verses that I want you to see, verse 14 and verse 15. It says in verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth. It means it motivates us. Because we judge that if one died, I'm sorry, let me back up. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. This sounds like, pff, what's that mean? The Bible tells us that all of us are dead in our sins. Nobody is going to be able to touch heaven with sin that they have in their body, in their life. And so all of us were dead. When Jesus Christ left heaven to come here to the earth, he came with a purpose. He came to die for sinners. Jesus Christ came here to die for dead people in sin. You see, there's nothing I can do to please God without Jesus Christ because myself, I'm dead. My sins make me dead in sin, trespassing sins. I cannot please God. And Jesus left heaven to come here to die for me let me go on look at verse 15 it says and that 
he, Jesus, died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see here, that resurrection is important. When Jesus Christ, now today is Saturday of this week. If it was that week when Jesus was here, this would have been the darkest of days. But Sunday morning, woo Sunday morning would have been the most exciting day in the history of the world. It still is. That day, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. What happened that day? For you and for me who are dead in trespass and sins, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he conquered, he conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered the devil. And Jesus Christ offered you and I, through his resurrection, <coughs> he offers us everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, and a new heavenly Father. That's amazing. It's amazing. The reality is you and I and every other person will die. That's not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you and me is if we die in our sin. When Jesus Christ has already paid off our sin debt, he already uh, lived without sin, perfect, here on the earth. He died taking on our sin. He was buried for our sin, but he rose from the grave. He conquered that sin for us, and now he offers it to us. The worst thing will not be to die. The worst thing will be to die without having received that gift. And Jesus Christ today offers it to you and to me. This is the good news for a dark day. I want to tell you today, the days that here that we're living right now, they're dark. But all the way back there in that second book of the Bible where we started today in Exodus chapter 12, it was dark back then too. And the people thought, what are we going to do? We've just killed our best lamb. What for? God was providing a way of escape for them. 1,300 years before Jesus was, was crucified. And God is now providing for us an escape from our sin. How? through the blood, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to encourage you. God has done everything God can do to provide for you a way to escape. Now responsibility goes to you. Have you received that gift from God? Or have you said, ah, I'm going to put it off, I'm going to wait till later. Or you said to God, no. You know, it doesn't matter. Today can be your day to receive. I want to encourage you. God offers you and me a gift. I thank God I receive that gift for myself. When I die, when, when I die, it will not be the worst thing for me. Why? Because as Jesus rose, I will rise also. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ, and I'm excited about that. But if you have not done that, Today, I pray you will do it with me. Here's what I want you to do. First, you have to understand you're a sinner. Every person is a sinner, me included, you included. That sin cannot, 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 cannot touch heaven. Jesus Christ came here, lived without sin, died, was buried, and rose again to wipe out your sin. Jesus Christ accepted your penalty for sin there on the cross in that grave. And he paid off your debt when he rose from the grave. But now you need to receive that for yourself. If you have never done that, I'm praying you'll do it right now with me. You can pray right now with me. You can copy, all right? But you need to mean, don't just blah, 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 or talk. No, you need to really mean it in the depth of your heart. But say to God, I understand I'm a sinner. I understand my sin separates you from me. 
I know I cannot pay back because I have too much sin in my past. And today and tomorrow will sin again. I need Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus Christ came here, lived without sin, perfect, died in my place, was buried and rose from the grave. I want that gift for me. I know you offer to me. I will take Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection as payment for my sin. I will trust Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ to forgive my sin. Thank you so much, Jesus' name. Amen. I hope, I hope, I hope you've, you've prayed that prayer with me. I will tell you today that the grave where Jesus was laid is empty. Saturday was a dark day, but Sunday, first day of the week, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he lives today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. I hope you've prayed with me. If you prayed with me today to receive Jesus Christ, we sign it this way. You, you took the cross for yourself. If you prayed with me today, please let me know in the comments or, or send me an email. You'll be able to do that through YouTube, Facebook, whatever. I would love to hear from you. I, would, I want to send you some good information to help you to know what is next. I'm praying for you. Thank God for you, and I pray you'll continue to be faithful to God in the dark days.